If it continues, we're going to see the price forced higher because regardless, again, how the price is determined, if you get enough demand, the price is going to come up. Physical silver and gold in your hands. Personal service, competitive prices, and zero complaints. That's Miles Franklin. Call us at 1-800-822-8080 or email us at info at milesfranklin.com. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with the Miles Franklin Market Update. And back with us today is the silver guru, one of the top silver experts, David Morgan from themorganreport.com. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Elijah, it's always fun to be with you. Thank you. It's great to have you. And I really wanted to have you on because last time we had you on, essentially you were saying the silver market was broken and there is this fundamental shift happened that ha with respect to the silver squeeze. You know, we saw a lot of people get into the silver market. We've seen a lot of young people get into the silver market and we're still seeing incredible demand in the silver market. And that's what I wanted to get an update on is what kind of demand are we seeing in the silver market right now? And how has there continued to be differences from what we saw in the past to what we see now? Okay, well, what we saw in the past compared to what we see now is participation. We're seeing much broader participation for longer duration. So in other words, like in the 2008 crisis, financial crisis, there was a great deal of savvy people that bought silver basically at the bottom paid a huge premium. The spot price on the silver market was like nine or slightly less. And, the, you know, 100 ounce bars were going for as high as like 13. And yet people bought it because that was as low a price as you could get, you know, retail product. And that lasted for a while. And then it sort of died off. <clears throat> this time we're seeing something similar, although it's not on a spike low. It is uh, in a trading range, kind of goes from well, as low as 24 up to 26, 26 and a half. We're in kind of that range right now. And buying seems to be steady. And the reason I use the word broken, and it might have been too harsh a word, I don't want to play a game of semantics. But when the spot price is determined, it's determined in the silver market, which means commercial 1,000 ounce bars. And now the commercial thousand ounce bars or what's commonly referred to as the silver market is broken because the spot price you see on the um, CME, the Commodity Mercantile Exchange, or on a subset like a Kitco or a Miles Franklin or a Monex or one of these other places is not the price you actually pay for a commercial bar. And that is something that's, in my strong view slash study, I've never really seen it, at least not to this degree. You see some backwardation occasionally. You might see, you know, the spot month be higher than the next couple of months out, and that's happened. But usually corrects itself pretty quickly. But here, it appears that we're seeing, you know, a continuous and look, we're only looking at a few weeks here. We're looking at maybe a month, month and a half. So I don't want to make a big case that, you know, it's going to go on forever, but it's gone on for that many weeks. On top of that, we're seeing a kind of a push toward people, even in the silver market, becoming more aware of how this paper paradigm really works. And one of the big things is an unallocated account, which many people get because it's convenient and it costs less. But basically, you're buying, in some cases, working inventory of a mint or working inventory of somebody that uses silver in a commercial process for industry. And you can, in most cases, switch to allocator, which means you actually own the bar or the silver. And there's been a push the last, I guess, month and a half or so for people that have a pool account or an uh, unallocated account to switch it over into hard metal in their hand. And that I think is something very interesting. And I think that's contributing to the overall, let's say squeeze. I don't think it's really a hard squeeze yet, but the difference, you know, in a bank run is, you know, when 
you know, everyone lines up at the door and says, I want my money, and there's not enough cash in the vault to satisfy the complete demand, but you don't know when that occurs. Does it occur with the third person in line, the 30th person in line, or the 300th person in line, or the 3,000th person in line? But the metaphor I'm making is that that appears to be a good metaphor for what's taking place, Elijah, which means, you know, it could be days away, weeks away, or maybe it'll fizzle out. We've had tightness in the market before, and we've seen it subside and, you know, more or less reach equilibrium as determined by the paper price, because whatever the paper price is and how it's determined, there's enough physical silver, commercial bars, to satisfy whatever the physical demand is. And as long as that's able to take place, you're not going to see much of a you know, real squeeze on the silver price. It's only when the silver bars are in such demand that it cannot be met or they're struggling to be met that you will see it. And that, I think, is happening now. And again, to repeat, the reason I can say that with authority is there's a premium on commercial bars on the spot market. And it's been reported, which I haven't verified, that there's even a weight. I know Andy Sheckman, who's, you know, the CEO of Miles Franklin, has stated for the public record that to obtain 1,000-ounce bars in size is not an instantaneous situation anymore. It takes, and I don't want to misquote him, but it takes time which is unusual because usually spot market means spot. You put money down on the spot and you take the product. That's not occurring everywhere. It's probably occurring in some places. I think that's a really interesting point you make about how, yeah, like the thousand ounce bar market really should be the silver market, right? But we're seeing this disconnect here where, yeah, it's difficult to get the bars or there's premiums on there. What kind of premiums are we seeing right now? Depends who you talk to. So if you are leaving it on the exchange, then the premiums are somewhere around 50 cents, which is normally maybe, you know, to take a, is normally it's the spot price, basically. So the contract would change hands. The warrant would be in somebody else's possession and you would have the bar with the number on it or bars or multiple bars or several contracts or whatever. Now it's around 50 cents just to, Retag it. If you want delivery and you want to load it or unload it onto, you know, out of a warehouse or a vault, then that gets to be more cost because of, you know, transportation and, you know, insurance and other things that go along with. It. There's insurance in the COMEX, but I'm talking about other factors. There's a fee you have to pay to take it out. And there's, of course, transportation. So in those cases, you might use a round number of about a dollar, maybe as high as a dollar twenty. So, you know, I don't want to, well, I will split hairs because, you know, I've been criticized. Well, it isn't a dollar twenty. Well, it is if you take delivery physically out of the vault. And if you don't remove it from the vault, it is much less, but it's still at a premium, which is the point. And so what does this really say to the demand for silver we might see in the future and the ability to get silver? Like if, if it's hard right now to get thousand ounce bars or you're paying a little bit of a premium, what kind of disconnect could we see then in the future if this kind of demand continues? Well, that's the key word I was going to make you say, it, if it continues. So if it continues, then of course we can, you know, use a linear projection and extend it and linear projections usually don't work, but we could surmise that we're going to see further and further tightness in the market. And that means I, one begets the other because it like using the metaphor of a bank run, once people sniff that their money may not be safe and they go from unallocated to allocated, and then there's a rumor that, you know, couldn't happen or I've got to wait weeks or whatever, and maybe not a rumor, maybe it's a fact, but once the word gets out one way or the other, that there is a tightness in the market. In fact, it's so tight that some people are told, you know, wait an excessive amount of time, or you can't, we're going to settle in cash, or, you know, we're backlogged, you got to get at the back of the line or whatever. So this feeds on itself because, you know, there's nothing more emotional than money uh, for most people. 
And there's nothing more emotional in, uh, in the monastery sphere uh, than the precious metals, with the exception of probably Bitcoin. I would say, you know, if you would have asked me, you know, what's the most emotionally charged financial product in the world? For years, I would have said silver, having been, you know, so close to it for so many years. But I would say since Bitcoin has really come to the fore the last several years, I think there's actually more emotional attachment one way or the other to Bitcoin than there is on the silver. So I didn't digress too far, Elijah, but if it continues, we're going to see the price forced higher because regardless, again, how the price is determined, if you have enough pressure in any market, I don't care if it's oats or soybean oil or apples, if you get enough demand, the price is going to come up. Now, did you want to expand on what is causing this increase in demand or short supply, really, the tight silver market right now? Part of it is demand, but also part of it, uh, we were talking before the interview, how it seems like it's actually uh, on the mining side as well. Can you expand on this? Yeah, you have to look at both sides, supply and demand. So supply, you could say, uh, for a fact, you know, that the illness caused a uh, closing down of some of the mines and there's all kinds of numbers out there and I have yet to see, I won't see the CPM study or the world silver survey study for another month, month and a half on them. And of course I'll go through them. The projection for the world silver survey of the silver Institute was, I forget, I think around three or 4% is pretty minor. I think it's probably more like six to 10%. And the reason I say that is a lot of mines were closed for two months and two twelfths is, you know, one sixth, which is what in a fraction, 16% or something. So I think, uh, I think it's more than three or 4%. So there's that. On top of that, if you look at, you know, the last 100 years of silver mining, there's been a lot more production in the last decade. However, the grade has continually gone down. Now, there's a little bit of extra thinking about the grade because you could have in, a, in an open pit mine, basically the grade is dispersed. It's usually very low and you're not going to be able to high grade it. But in a, a hard rock mine, an underground vein mine, you can high grade it. So if the silver price is high enough for a company to make money, be profitable, pay everybody uh, at um, $25 silver, uh, and they can do that in the low grade area, they'll do that and they'll save the high grade for the future where they expect to see higher prices. Or if the price is lower, they're almost forced to high grade in order to keep the company profitable. So there's some variance in it. It's not just a flat statement that you can have, um, you know, that the grade is going down across the board Generally, it is, but there are, as I just said, there are exceptions in a hard rock mine of when you have the geology pretty figured out. And, you know, think of mine like the Lucky Friday from Hecla. I mean, there's areas that you could look at. I've been there. I've been in that mine, I think, two or three times. And, you know, from, you know, of course, the mine engineers and everything else, I'm not a geologist, but I've certainly spent my time in mines. And you could see, you know, well, that area over there, we're kind of saving for da, 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 rainy day, you might say. And this area over here, we're already set up. So plus, so that's it. I wanted to labor the point, but there is the supply is coming down. Um, and we're leveled off here. I mean, the supply of silver has been decreasing, I think, around 3% for the last few years. There are some, you know, billion ounce deposits that I put in the Morgan New Court, but these are not mines. They are discoveries, and there aren't many of them. And so, you know, we could probably stay around the level we are right now. And one thing that could change it a little bit would be the recycling. I mean, most a lot of people have the misconception that all silver ends up in the landfill, and that's not true. A great deal is recycled, somewhere around 165 to 185 million ounces a year, depending on which study you choose to take the number from. But, you know, one of the companies that I have and I'll be putting out on the free list here soon, I've done it before, I'll do it again, is a uh, e-waste company that recycles everything from printed circuit boards, which gives you 
you know, gold, silver, tin, copper is taken off it before they put it through the cycle. So there's a lot of metals that you can obtain from a printed circuit board. And so if, when that uh, takes off, and it's not just this company, but the industry as a whole, you will see, re, you know, recycled metal go from, I'll just make up numbers. I don't know exactly. I know what the pro forma looks like, but from 160 million ounces a year to 260 million ounces a year, let's say in five years or something like that. So getting back to the general uh, markets, if we look at the gold and silver markets right now, and maybe first the silver market, you've said it could be at a bottom currently. We're kind of bottoming out right now. Why do you see that? Well, you know, the market knows more than anybody, and I'm a market student. I'm always trying to learn more about markets in general, not just the metals. So, you know, how the stock market, bond market, currency market, you name it. And, you know, after a while, you do start to learn things. Also, technical analysis is a tool, and it works most of the time, not always. So, we just saw silver go down last week to 24 and it bounced back to 25 in about three days worth of trading. And that shows a lot of strength. So, does that prove it? No, but it's an indication. Gold is just really unloved. The sentiment indicator on gold is so low, it's almost a gimme that it's got to be close to bottom here. When everybody despises it, that's a good time to buy an automobile, apples, soybean oil, or gold. So I think we are there. We don't know. Uh, again, the market could say something different. And lastly, I think it's psychology. I mean, most people that are in the stock market really have an idea that, you know, you can't keep making new highs forever when the physical economy is struggling so much. When you have so many issues with the food chain, you have issues with the semiconductor industry, you have issues with transportation and supply chains on a global basis. So to keep the stock market elevated when the physical economy is so different from that will eventually, if not fairly soon, be rectified where the two come more together with physical reality rather than, you know, how much stock buying pressure there is. So I think we're going to see a correction in the stock market. <clears throat> we're starting to see the beginning of, uh, I think, the end of the 40-year bull market and the bond market. Stocks and bonds used to be neg negatively correlated, but that's not true anymore. They're really highly correlated now. So jumping from equities into bonds is not a good idea anymore, or vice versa. So I think if we see what I expect this year, a uh, decrease in participation in the paper markets, bonds, and stocks, the best is basically negatively correlated is, is gold, usually. I haven't really checked it against Bitcoin, so you could probably make that. I don't know if it's negatively correlated to the stock market or not, but it certainly acts um, as, a, as a vacuum almost for people that are looking for an alternative to stocks, bonds, or gold. So there's that to consider as well. So you're saying uh, kind of a bear market in the stock market and the bond market going forward. And then, yeah, like gold and silver are alternatives, right? So um, very bullish on those. Now, I've also been hearing the perspective that the fact that there are a lot of mergers and acquisitions happening in the mining sector kind of signals that producers are seeing that uh, this is a bottom right now and we're off to the races going forward. Do you think the fact that we're seeing a lot of mergers and acquisitions right now is signaling that? Uh, that's a great question. I'll give you, it's a it's mixed. I mean, gold miners, especially the big ones, are pretty notorious for buy, you know for doing an M and A merger and acquisition at the wrong time when prices are high instead of low. But there are the companies that are more savvy. And I think the industry as whole well has become wiser. Uh, you know, I've been in it forty years, really. I've only been you know, on the internet like 23 or so, but I mean, I traded silver almost daily from the time I was quite young. So anyway, it's mixed. But again, to, to your point, I think now that um, the real smart miners, uh, you can name them, are, are doing what you're saying. They're looking at this 
level in the 20s, mid 20s for right now, especially on an inflation adjusted basis as being a low. It is the time to use your ability, if you have it, to you know, pledge equity, give shares for an asset or, or cash or whatever, so or a combination. So yeah, I think it is a good time. And I think a lot of them are thinking that. I just want to point out that historically, they get out of phase, you know, instead of, you know, high prices buy more, no, high prices, you should be selling low prices buy more, no, low prices, you know, not so, but it varies. And right now, as I said, just to repeat one more time, yeah, it's a good time and it is happening. Now, to kind of wrap up, to kind of step back and get a very fundamental view or long-term view on the silver market, I know you recently made a video kind of making the case for is silver valued, should silver be valued at $400? And that might seem shocking to a lot of people, but what is your case for $400 silver? Well, I'm making a case that silver has been to 400. I'm not necessarily making the case that it should be at 400, although you can make the argument. But to get to 400, you've got to get to 100 first. My point was that when silver was the same thing as gold, money and money alone, before the electronics industry, before the advent of the automobile and all that, when both were treated the same, the ratio, the natural ratio was cl- pretty close to the monetary ratio. And when Warren Buffett you know, announced his purchase, there was a chart that was in Forbes magazine that showed the inflation adjusted price of silver going back to the 1300s. And if you look at that chart, and I did it in the video, so I'm not like making it up, I showed my source, you'll see that from 1344 to 1544, which is 200 years, silver traded at roughly $400 an ounce. So that was the main point. It's like, don't argue with the fact, here it is. And then if you wanna take it further, you can go. What's interesting, as silver was demonetized more and more and used less and less in the monetary system, you see the price come down and down and down. And then it spiked to the, what I call the monetary ratio, 16 to one during the, the top of the market in 1980 when silver hit $50 in today, it was basically 16 to one ratio to gold. It only lasted that day really. And, so my point is, it's always been, and I think always will be from here on out, monetary demand or investment demand <clears throat> that will propel sil- silver higher. I mean, one thing that astonishes me, but, you know, I'm kind of a silver nut, but, you know, if you go back just 100 years, you didn't have silver, you didn't have any money whatsoever. You know, we weren't directly on a silver standard, although I think China still was in the, at that time frame. I'd have to check my memory, but... You know, silver coinage still existed, you know, Canada and the United States and other countries. And that was, you know, the coin of the realm, basically on a global basis. And everybody knew it because if you didn't have it, you didn't have any money. Now, of course, there are people out there that claim silver isn't money at all. It's only an industrial metal. I would say they're wrong. I would say it's money and an industrial metal. But... how quickly things can change, you know, in roughly a hundred years, it's gone from like the premier monetary asset to it's never talked about in the mainstream financial media whatsoever. So it's, it's interesting, but the internet, I think will bring more awareness. Uh, The wall street, the Reddit group, the wall street silver groups, bringing a lot of awareness and the blockchain is something that we haven't talked about much, but I think the blockchain combination with precious metals is where the vulnerability lies because that's the way the whole push of the financial system is going and the monetary system. And within that subset, there's precious metals and there's nothing easier now than, you know, going to Apple pay and paying for your coffee at some coffee shop with your phone, which is what the younger generation does. They get the idea correctly that, you know, having a precious metals backed, uh, digital currency is really the way to go. That's a stable coin. And that catches on. Uh, you know, you've got several billion people out there that might be using their phones and their digital silver and gold is taking physical supply off the market in an amount never dreamed of before. All right. Well, David Morgan, we really appreciate your time today and all your insights that you've given us 
If our viewers are interested in hearing more of these interviews, they can hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified of all the new interviews we're doing. And if people can find you, where can they uh, find your work? The best thing is just go to the main landing page, themorganreport.com, get on our opt-in list and get our free newsletter. Uh, I also would recommend you go to the blog, which is just a pull-down menu. And there's some a uh, little bit of advertising over the right-hand side, one's for a silver stacking program. Uh, there's another one for a digitally backed or a physically backed digital uh, gold and silver opportunity. And uh, one other one for uh, putting your silver or gold to work on a leasing situation that I know a lot of people hate the word leasing, but you know, check it out. It's from Keith Weiner, who I totally respect and absolutely trust. Um, and that would be for a higher net worth individual that wanted to put some metal to work. But I certainly wouldn't recommend putting a lot. I mean, I would say 10 percent if you're a real risk uh, taker, you know, 20 percent. All right. Once again, David, thank you so much for your time and God bless. God bless you. Thanks. Physical silver and gold in your hands. Personal service, competitive prices, and zero complaints. That's Miles Franklin. Call us at 1-800-822-8080 or email us at info at milesfranklin.com.